thanks so much for inviting me along to give a brief presentation about ASPAC. So ASPAC is the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children. Um, you know, thanks to the organisers, thanks Jenny, thanks Rebecca for having us along. Um, and I'm not going to do a sort of a, a classical presentation structure, so there'll be no acknowledgements at the end. So it's important for me to thank the teams for these cohorts and ASPAC in particular. So folk who run it on the ground, but also the participants who take part, not to mention our supporters, our funders. Um, it's a real opportunity for us to present it uh, at a talk like this. Um, and for, for us, it's, a, it's all about, it's about outreach and, and, and trying to connect to different user groups. Um, so thanks for that. So first, I just want to reflect on a um, an, an experience that that I was involved in a little while ago, and I was at a welcome four year PhD meeting at the at the trust at the Gibbs Building, and I had this interaction with a with a colleague, and it really stands out for me, uh, and it made me start to think very hard about connecting communities and making sure researchers understand our research assets and have access. I actually saw this as a bit of a challenge to us, so. I was approached and was having a discussion with them about PhD students and I put the, the question about whether we could get more students using our study. And, and they were econometricians and they were doing some really fabulous research looking into various social factors and, and, and things which are having impacts on, on health. Uh, and, and the response came back almost immediately, which was, oh, but, but, but ASPAC is a biomedical study. You know the, the suggestion being that we can't access it in some way or that there's some some difference for the study which which was a real challenge and i thought maybe a bit disappointing on our part that we hadn't done enough to reach out so hopefully this is a good opportunity for me to sort of build some bridges here and and reach out in a different way to a, a separate research community well, actually that's not true not a separate research community at all one which offers specific research expertise in a different way that we want to interact with the study itself, and you can concentrate really on the pedigree shape diagram on the right here, is a multi-generational study that runs longitudinally. Approximately 14,000 pregnancies, so this, the index unit of this study is a pregnancy, not a person necessarily. So almost 75%, in fact a little over 75% of all the pregnancies in the greater Bristol area in the southwest of the UK were recruited and now form across a multi-generational follow-up which is 30 years old. So extremely detailed data, extremely deep, deep data across many domains, different omics, different measures from questionnaires, different face-to-face -face interactions, different record linkages. And I'll tell you a little bit about those now. Um, so there are multiple ways of getting some information about the study. There are cohort profiles in the International Journal of Epidemiology. We've got lots of data and also um, descriptions of our uh, data collection efforts in welcome open research. Um, there was a neat paper published some time ago now in Nature by Rebecca Pearson, which charts the history of the study. And the point that I just want to make here is that there is a deep collection running through time. The, the cartoon on the top right here just shows that there are not, uh, you know, not just questionnaires, but samples, blood and hair and toenails and urine and teeth and so on being collected routinely across the ages. And this, uh, this paper was actually published when we were only 21 years old. We're now 30 years old. So this is marched on. And the key thing here is that these data collections, be it through biological samples or through questionnaires or through measures, are multi-domain. So they're not just sitting across single biological entities, but a broader spectrum. Okay, I wanted to touch a little bit alongside those questionnaires and biological records on linkage. We've got a deep and long running linkage collection in, in ALSPAC, which sits across primary and secondary points of access and a whole bunch of other stuff. I just wanted to flag criminal records as one of our latest record linkages. So this is getting assets from the local constabulary, so Avon uh, uh, local constabulary, and, and record linking to existing criminal records data to start to understand exposures to uh, adversity and violent events and how they relate to uh, social structures across our study. Now, I just wanted to mention at this point, you're gonna see some faces throughout the slides. So the first one here is Rosie Cornish in Bristol, who's working on these data. And I've asked all of the folk who have been mentioned in this talk, whether they can be contacted. And the last slide of my presentation will have contact details for all of them. So if you want to follow up, um, then it's absolutely fine. And you can get in touch and ask these guys more questions about the type of work that's going on. Okay. 
current output from uh, from uh, uh, from our spec i wanted to just I, I went back and looked up what we actually do and where the re, where the papers are going and what's happening across the study and sure there are uh, uh, medical and molecular epidemiology uh, epidemiology contributions which are coming out routinely but if you look across the scopus metrics from our papers you can see actually that um social science is, is a major area of activity and, and whilst we'll know that the, the metrics that you can get from papers like this in an automated way are limited, I was really encouraged to see just how much material is coming out in this, in this area, but also to see the overlap between different areas, between social and medical sciences in particular. I thought that's very encouraging and we can only do more to try and get more activity in that direction. Visibility and access, so this is critical, and we all know that this is a changing space. Uh, um, Biobank are a field leading with the ways in which they're trying to democratize access to their data. But a study like OUSMAC has got um, um, connections through organizations like Maelstrom to make front end visibility better. And that's something that our colleagues in Canada and elsewhere are also doing. We're part of the HDI UK alliances and absolutely proud to be part of Closer and Closer Discovery. And these are all sort of broad uh, and blanket ways to, to ensure visibility of the study. But we also see ourselves really as a key part of a broader portfolio of research assets, in particular uh, to do with epidemiology and the type of uh, um, uh, biological and social sciences that we are heavily involved in. And that portfolio is made up of different flavors of study from extremely large whole population based initiatives and linkage all the way down to bespoke studies set up around specific hypotheses. And, and we're kind of in the midst of that really. And it's that portfolio that I think is really exciting for, for all of us researchers trying to do things relevant for health and well-being. In NASVAC specifically, uh, we have um, a number of sort of operational activities that we call core components. And that is everything from running face-to-face -face examinations all the way through to data management and the running of the study. And access for us sits behind a specific policy which has been developed over the running of the study and is renewed regularly. And this is there and is important because it reflects the consent nature of our participants involvement in the study. And we're bound to this and it's a promise to our participants, but it, it dictates the way in which one can get access to, to data. For us, a re, you know, an individual with a research question, so a scientist, uh, both from a bona fide institution, uh, will find ASPAC through a number of different ways, whether that's online catalogues, whether that's databases, whether that's presentations and publications, or you can go onto our websites and look at variables of interest through our online search engines. That gives you a feel for what's available in the study, at which point you raise an application to the study. An online proposal form exists. That's the OPS you can see in the middle of that diagram on the bottom there. That OPS is sent automatically to our data team who can either can triage and make a, um, a, a decision not based on academic cred credentials, but based on the integrity of the researcher about releasing data. If it's more involved or collecting new data, it's raised with our executive who sit weekly and then who can organize either the setup and initiation of a study or the release of biosamples and data either directly or through secure access routes like UK SERP. So we try and make that as light touch as possible. And over the years, we've tried to mature that system away from one which is highly resourced in terms of preparing data and getting everything ready. So pu pushing FTEs into developing data with much less available for support. And we try to rebalance that and give more support to supporting researchers who want to use our data. And we're trying to streamline and pull resources away from data prep. So immediate access and easy access to data with as much handholding as possible to make research a possibility. So the next part of the study really focuses on exemplars because I thought that would be the most effective way to, to show you what's going on within, within ASMAC. Um, and I've got a series of those which I'll keep very short but just to remind you again that this is about um, giving you access to researchers and each one of the stories that I'm going to tell in short is coupled with a researcher and a contact that I'll give you at the end and they're all happy for you to reach out and talk to them about doing social science or social science aligned activity in ASPAC. So, right, and, and the, I'll make a brief point here, which is I've elected to say studies like ASPAC because I'm hoping that this story is one which sits across many of our cohorts, which are seen to be biomedical, but actually I truly believe are going to be useful right across uh, our research community. 
Right, first example, which which is I think is really fascinating, and and, and it, it speaks to the anthropology and the ethnography of the studies themselves. Really trying to understand who participants are, why they're involved in these studies, uh, and what what makes them tick. Are they the same as everybody else? Are they part of something different? And Sarah Gibbon at UCL has done some fantastic work in this field and has now got a four year investigator award explicitly examining the biosocial research which is present in and the contribution of participants to that type of research across a number of cohorts, not just in the UK with Ausback, but around the world. And it's a really explicit example of trying to get at the sociodemographic or the social anthropological underpinnings of being part of a study. Okay, second example, mental health. So we have to say something about mental health. It's such an extraordinarily important part of what we do. It's a very large chunk of our data. It forms a lot of our research outputs. I'm a genetic epidemiologist and since 2005 to now I've seen gen epi come down in the rankings of use and mental health really drive up. It's a, it's a really major output for us. Really good example of the type of data and work that we do. So this is Rebecca Pearson, who's, who's actually just got a chair in Manchester. And she, this is her work looking at era specific events related to depression in mums, showing rather radical shifts in a, a peri, a, a, um, perinatal depression in mothers of babies in the early 90s compared to babies being born now. Now these shifts, of course, one can talk about in terms of measurement differences and so on, but the differences are marked. And that's an interesting academic point. The structural point to have in mind is that with longitudinal data, one can start to unpick era specific effects. And that sits in a broader context of longitudinal work, which has looked to track the trajectories of mental health through time in our participants. And you can only do that where you've got longitudinal studies with fine, uh, uh, fine data, so granular data that look at people's health through time. And this is Alex Kwong, who's really forged the way in looking at longitudinal patterns of mental health. Right, example three, so social inequality. And, and this is Tim Cadman in Bristol, who's very much part of the Life Cycle Initiative, which is a multi-collection, so pan-European initiative, which brings together different cohorts, including Ausback, uh, and also uh, our friends born in Bradford and others within the UK. Uh, this is work which is looking at um, health and well-being uh, outcomes in relation to social inequalities, but also importantly, the distribution of those social inequalities in mental health across cohorts in different places. What's really exciting here is that one can draw from in the studies across a broad area, not only for the undertaking of meta-analyses to find consistent effects, but also to understand from the presence of heterogeneity across those studies. Okay, example four, I think this is really exciting. This is the interplay between biomedical research as we might define it and social research. And, and I wanted, and Tim Morris here, again at the University of Bristol has done lots of work in this field. Importantly, not always looking at how biomedical could have an influence on social, which is kind of the, the doctrine that we often think about or think is overemphasized, but also looking in the reverse direction and how social features can have an impact on our undertaking and interpretation of biomedical research and results for that matter. And this is a nice overview paper that came out recently that Tim led, which was starting to examine the implications of social features for research undertaken in particular in genetics and that, that area of biomedical science. Tim is in this, in this work is, is charting how uh, um, uh, social structures such as the structure of data within populations, so and, and one's ethnic origins and ancestral origins, so uh, origins, so population stratification, as we call it in our field, how that can have an effect on understanding genetic relationships, how dynastic effects are the red lines here, so that's one generation's phenotypic relationships can have an impact on the health and well-being of the next generation. So I called them era effects earlier in the in the mental health example but how they can have an effect on how we interpret genetic associations. And then also how assortative mating, so the absence of panmictis. So this is choosing your mate, choosing your partners on the basis often of social structures can then have an influence on the interpretation of genetic findings and genetic associations. So I think this is super exciting because this is the interface, isn't it, between biomedical activity and social science and trying to work together to understand our data in a more appropriate way. Okay, and, and last, last off, I think it would be churlish not to mention uh, uh, what's going on at the moment in the pandemic and also to consider the implications of that and, and how we've been trying to 
uh, uh, work at the social interface as well as understanding infectious disease. Uh, this is a story that I'll be brief on because I think my friends from uh, uh, Generation Scotland will pick up on it as well. But early in March last year, we started off with a fantastic crowd bringing together some shared questionnaire material, which is now live and anybody can ac get access to, but importantly represents now a core set of information on the shared experience of COVID-19 across our populations. And you can go to that website to have a look at this. Um, but that's evolved. It's evolved into something really exciting. It now sits within a, a collection of data that we've organized actually on a timeline to show off when events across the pandemic occur and what data are available in our cohorts to chart this. It's part of another initiative called the National Core Studies, which have brought together researchers to address key questions related to the pandem pandemic. Uh, and of course, that it absolutely includes social factors, mental health, and so on. And here's two of our brilliant researchers, Gareth Griffith on the left-hand side and Alex again, who have been working on this and, and, and reflecting personally on also their ability to generate work which is impactful, which cuts across or uses cohort data to look at really important social factors that are falling out as a result of the pandemic. You can go and have a look at a recent output from that, which is a paper that has just dropped on Med Archive, uh, 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 which includes data from across multiple cohorts, but addresses mental health specifically through, uh, through the period of mitigation and the trials and tribulations of, of lockdown. But also, I'd just like to mention that that was now also fed back into the clinical community, and we're now considering the implications of bringing together data like that for trying to understand features like long COVID and the fallout, not just the biomedical side of it, but also the implications in different domains. Right then, so to, to wrap up, um, so look, ASMAC does represent one of the, you know, collection of, of, of putatively biomedical studies. Um, but I, I, I'd like to stress that I really, for internally, we don't really see ourselves as an, as an explicit biomedical study. We are a research asset, which we want as many research communities to use as possible. And we welcome more social science use explicitly. I would argue that our aggregate data through 30 years of running falls across many domains, including social science. And we have a rich vein of form in that area. Um, and we just would like to do more and get more users. I think we can say um, with confidence that the, da the data that we have across uh, questionnaires, social interactions, face-to-face -face examinations, and so on, including record linkage, um, are extremely detailed. But the critical feature, I think, is that we bring that detail alongside longitudinal records, which can be used to track trajectories in, in health and well-being, but also to look at era-specific events. So I've mentioned them both as time-specific or era events in the mental health example, but also dynastic effects where generations can have an effect on each other. I also mentioned that I think it's a really exciting way to think about this is that there is an interplay between domains that we previously considered as biomedical or social science. And when they come together, I think that's actually extraordinarily interesting. And we've got really good examples. Um, you know, the work that we've done with the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium, looking at uh, um, uh, um, educational attainment, for example, and trying to understand the underpinnings behind uh, uh, um, educational attainment and what the relevance of that is for policy. So, so I, I, that was the pitch really from our spec. That's what we are. And, and, and now just to reiterate this, that we've got, a, you know, you can contact me directly. So n.j.timson at bristol.ac.uk, please do. You can contact our executive if you want to know more about the study, please have a look online. But the researchers that I mentioned there, so Rosie, Sarah, Rebecca, Tim, Tim, Morris, um, Gareth and Alex are all available and have said that they're very happy to be contacted if you'd like to understand more from a social science point of view. The last website there is just the, um, the longitudinal, the Welcome Longitudinal Population Studies COVID questionnaire group. And if you want to know more about that, then you can email that, 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 that link there. So with that, I'll, I'll close. Uh, thanks again to the organizers of this thing. It's a fantastic uh, initiative and opportunity and very happy to take some questions and, and Lynn will join.